I wanted to make a video so that you could uh, look at some of the homework problems um, at home and take your time going back through them to get ready for your quiz. So we're going to take a look um, at some of the problems in your packet. This is problem number three. Um, and in this problem, a rock is thrown vertically in the air and you are given, you start out given a position function and this represents the position of the particle at any time t. You can see that this function is quadratic so basically the path of the particle is doing something like that because the a value is negative. Part A asks you to find the velocity and the acceleration as functions of time. So um, we know that velocity is equal to the first derivative of position. So we're simply going to uh, find the derivative using the power rule. The derivative of 24t would just be 24. And the derivative of the second term would be negative 1.6 t. And then to find the acceleration, we're going to find the second derivative of position. So acceleration uh, would be equal to the first derivative of velocity which would be the derivative of 24 is 0 and the derivative of the second term would be equal to negative 1.6. Um, part B, the question is how long? So we're looking for a time. How long did it take the rock to reach its highest point? Now remember, if the uh, object is traveling along a parabola, then the highest point is going to be the vertex of that parabola. And the velocity at that highest point at that instant of time is going to be zero. So what they're really asking us to figure out is when is the velocity zero. So we're going to take our function from part A, the velocity, set it equal to zero and solve and that will give us a time at when the um, object reached its highest point and you can do that with your calculator and you can check the answers in your packet to see if you get it right. Part C asks us how high did the rock go? So again, this is a position question. So they want us to find S of T. And the T that they're looking for is the time that we just found right here. So we're going to substitute that into the position function to find out um, how high the rock went when it was at its highest point. Part D piggybacks off of that. When did the rock reach half of its maximum height? Well, whatever my output is for this problem uh, in C, I'm going to take half of that. And the question again is when, so we're looking for a time. Did the rock reach its maximum height? Well, height is a uh, position. So basically they're saying when is the position equal to half of the maximum. Now again, the maximum is what we got out of part C. So each question just kind of piggybacks off of the other one. Finally, in part E, the question is, how long was the rock aloft? Um, another way of uh, thinking about that question is, when did the rock hit the ground? Because that's how long it was in the air. That's a position question. So basically they're saying, when did the rock hit the ground? When is the position zero? So we're going to set the position function equal to zero and we're going to solve for t. Alright, so that's how you deal with problem number three and again the answers are in your packet. Problem number eight, um, we have a function that represents the growth of bacteria and the question asks us um, the growth rates, let me move this out of the way, the growth rates at particular times so we know we're looking for specific growth rates since b of t represents um, the number of bacteria in the population we're going to find the derivative of b using the power rule um, and keep in mind that 10 to the 6 is a constant so the derivative of that would be 0 10 to the 4th would be a coefficient and 10 to the 3rd would be coefficient don't get confused by that and try to try to apply the power rule uh, when those are just numbers. And then once we find the derivative by the power rule, we're going to evaluate that derivative at 0, we're going to evaluate that derivative at 5, 
and we're going to evaluate that derivative at 10 and of course those numbers would come off of our calculator and that would tell you how fast the population is growing at those particular times. Next problem, um, wait I think there might be another one on the other page, let's go back. Yes there is. Uh, we have another position problem. The, they give you the position function again. Uh, they want to know the body's acceleration. So first thing we have to do is find the acceleration. So we're going to take the position function and to get to acceleration we have to go to velocity. So velocity would be the first derivative of position by the power rule. And then from there we're going to find acceleration which would be the first derivative of the velocity function. Um, and that's pretty simple using the power rule. But they want to know in particular the body's acceleration each time velocity is zero. Remember the word is is your verb which means equal. So they're basically saying take the velocity function, set it equal to zero, and solve it for t. Once you solve for t, you're going to take that value whatever, uh, for whatever values they have, then you're going to go and find the acceleration. Number 13, a body's velocity at a time t is given. So this time they're starting you out with the velocity function they want you to find the body's speed. Now please remember that speed is the absolute value of velocity. And they want to know the, the body's speed each time the acceleration is zero. So again, we have to take the velocity function, find the first derivative to get acceleration, set that equal to zero and solve for t. So we want to know the times at which the acceleration was zero. Then we're going to take the times that we find, put them back into the velocity function, but we have to take the absolute value uh, because the question is asking us to find speed. Number 21B. I did not ask you to do A. In part B, they're asking you to estimate, this is an important word, the velocity. So the velocity indicates that we're looking for instant rate of change. So that indicates that we're looking for a derivative. And they've told us we have a table, so we're going to estimate that. Now remember the way that we estimate. If we want to find the derivative or the instant velocity at 1, we're going to use one value above in the table and one value below. And we're going to average those to find the average rate of change. And that is simply our best estimate of what the instant rate of change would be because um, we, we don't know what the curve looks like and we don't have the function. Same thing with 2.5 when I want to find the instant rate of change or the instant velocity at 2.5. I'm going to choose one value above in the table and one value below and find the average rate of change which I'll use to approximate the instant rate of change. Okay, problem number 23. In this particular problem, they are giving me a velocity graph, and then they start asking me all kinds of questions about it, so I have to interpret the, the graph correctly. First question, when does the body reverse direction? Now, in order for an object to change direction, the sign of velocity must change. Now it doesn't matter whether it changes from positive to negative or negative to positive, but the sign must change. So we can see that the velocity changes sign at 2 and the velocity changes sign at 7. Part B, when is the body moving at a constant speed? Well that's easy to see. Constant speed means that the velocity is not changing and the velocity remains constant at uh, negative 3 meters per second, uh, but the speed there would be positive 3 meters per second because remember speed is the absolute value of velocity. Now part C, I'm going to get rid of my writing because I need to make a graph. They want me to graph the body's speed. One more time, speed is the absolute value of velocity. So that's going to take all of the negative velocities and force them to be positive. So it's going to take this trapezoid down here 
and basically it's going to flip it up. All the negatives become positive, so we get a graph that looks something. This is not perfect. It gives you an idea like that. And so the speed graph would be what you see from the x-axis and above. And that would simply, you can interpret that graph to determine when the object is speeding up and when the object is slowing down. Again, speed, absolute value of velocity. Part D, they want us to graph the acceleration. Now again, I'm going to get rid of what I've written up there because acceleration has nothing, well, has very little to do with speed. Please do not think that speed and acceleration are the same. Acceleration is the first derivative of velocity. So we want to think about the slopes of velocity. Now since this graph is made up a series of linear segments, then over a period of time, for example, the slope along this segment is constant and we're rising 3 and we're running 1 so we have a slope of 3 so from 0 to 1 we have a slope of 3 so it's just a horizontal line segment that says the slope all the time on that segment is 3 or the acceleration is 3 from 1 to 3 we have a drop of 6 and a run of 2 so from 1 to 3, we are at an acceleration of negative 3, because again, we dropped 6 and ran to the right 2. From 3 to 7, we can see that the slope of this segment is 0. From 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, slope is 0. And then from... Okay, that's not right. That's 3 to 6. Let's erase that and back up. Okay, so from 3 to 6. And then from 6 to 8, we have a positive slope. We rise 6 and run 2. So we're back up to 3. 6, 7, 8. And then from 8 to 10, we have a negative slope of, we're dropping 3, and we're running to the right 2. So negative 1 and a half, negative 1 and a half. So from here, whoops, 8 to here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Yep, that's right. And check your answers in the packet.